The essence of transformational art and architecture as with all sacred and transformational art and architecture the meanings of the images and the relationships inside a structure or in various groupings of buildings one to another reflect a process of multi-dimensional understandings that grow, deepen, and transform in correspondence with the individual's conscious evolution. In other words, there is never an absolute meaning to any symbol. Symbols do not describe the sensory blueprints or models by which reality can be re represented or imaged. Rather, they ref refer to formulae by which relational processes rather than solid things are expressed. Expansion of a symbol is the development of its unexpressed reference. So every symbol represents essential aspects of reality before reality has been conceptually or experientially transformed into a dualistic apparency composed of nature and human in diametric opposition to supernatural and superhuman. In terms of living knowledge and understanding both the literal and metaphorical aspects of a symbolic situation are required for a balanced and impartial view. However, such a view is grounded in the transcendence of any ground whatsoever. It appears that much of mankind's history has been wrapped up in the reality of the mind becoming identified with and clinging to its own projections. Perhaps history, it, perhaps history itself would dissolve into the transcendent if the mind would relinquish its identification. So welcome to the Architects of Conscious Transformation. And uh, it seems like tonight <laughs> we have uh, a little bit of a uh, review. Previously, we were looking at the amazing art in Peru, the Nazca lines, so-called. And these are works of art that have been created, it seems, to uh, point our attention upward. Upward being beyond ourselves, beyond our sort of geographical conscious view. Our view as a, a geographical entity at a certain level of existence. These uh, works of art are very large in scale and really the only way they can be seen in a relevant way is from above. Now whatever the function of them is, whether they were for someone <laughs> flying down to to see us from, up, from above, or whether they were just representations to bring our, our attention to something beyond our current level of awareness, our current level of seeing and understanding. It doesn't really matter. These wonderful works of art have succeeded in capturing our attention across millennia. And so, whatever the purpose the artists had for creating these works, they have, in fact, succeeded 
and bringing us into a realization that there is something above us and that before this current time frame, before the time we're living in, there were humans or individuals who wished to pass on the idea that there is something to be given up, something to be offered up to the universe. And so, obviously, this looks like a, a strip of some sort. It could very well be a landing strip. I'm sure uh, someone who, who flies could easily land on something like this. But it doesn't really matter. The point is that these works have been created to arouse our attention. And then we went on into the high Andes, further south of Nazca, I would think, and... Uh, we came upon the incredible works of the Inca, who were the final, you might say, the last South American civilization along the coast of South America. And they produced rem remarkable works of architecture and art. The art has been mostly destroyed. However, the architecture, due to its massiveness, has <laughs> remained intact. And what was unique about it, what is unique about it, is that the Incans or the, the architects and builders who created these works were working in harmony with the stone structures, with the stone itself. And so they were creating what originally might have been called cyclopean in the sense that they used the original stones without really shaping them too much. So they, they look like boulders when they're in the walls and so forth. For example, here, they're gigantic. The, the size of these, these uh, stones is, <laughs> you know, 50 tons, some of that. Um, and yet, yet the, the, the builders were able to shave off and basically contour each of the different stones that were irregularly shaped into a cohesive pattern that created a wall, a straight wall in a sense, but with irregular asymmetrical um, elements to it. And truly, even though it's a wall, it is in fact, to me, very high art. And to many, it's high art in the sense that they have been able to create such asymmetrical irregularity and yet such precision at the same time. A, a, a marvelous message about being at once harmonized with and, and, and also contributing our own abilities, our own creativity into the existence of what, what uh, into the existing nature that, he, that is here and yet creating what we wish to do with it. It's, it's, uh, it's harmony with nature built into the very structure of what people lived in and into the very structure of people's lives. There was a great deal of harmony involved. I guess the attempt was to be harmonious as much as possible with what was already present in nature. And as you can see, these are um, amazing just as art as well as being structures architecturally. So we, we went to those cultures in South America and, and we saw that the, the human beings who were there before us wished to impart certain kinds of knowledge and perhaps the knowledge that they have or had is a very great benefit to us because it certainly does seem more than relevant nowadays to work in harmony with nature when we are building our own uh, habitations, our own temples or whatever we have, churches, uh, that they should be not kind of a, a, a violation in nature, a, a, just a an aggressive uh, kind of assault on nature when we when we build our own structures, but in ter in th in that sense, it should be in harmony with it to to build into nature and become a part of nature, become 
more at one with nature while we create our own human levels of experience. And then, as you can see, oh, oh there it was. <laughs> misplaced a slot, uh, misplaced uh, an image here. But that's also from Nazca, and you can see that the uh, these rather uniquely stylized figures, possibly of a coyote or a dog or whatever it is, is still recognizable. It's very recognizable today. And what is truly recognizable is the, the quality of the art, the quality of the, the imaging. It does, in effect, communicate to us even today, and whatever it communicates to us tells us that there is something greater, that, that even common forms, animals, uh, insects, that we are in contact with in our daily lives have a, a much deeper, more cosmic uh, aspect to them. They are, in fact, cosmic entities as well as Earth bound entities, so to speak, people, in, um, individuals and, and species living on the earth, but they are in fact connected to a much greater cosmic power. So, and then we went on from South America to Mesopotamia, to the cultures that are in, mostly in Sumer, we use the Sumerian civilization as an example of some of the, the great art and architecture that was being developed early on in what is now considered the beginnings of this cycle of civilizations, and at least one of them, one of, this, one of these uh, uh, seed civilizations was in Sumer, in Mesopotamia. And as we can see, uh, this culture was dedicated a great deal, and perhaps one of the last cultures in that part of the world was dedicated to the feminine, to the goddess, and this is Inanna. And she holds those two figures that she holds in her hand are infinity. Those, those are the symbols for infinity. And so she is winged, but she also has <laughs> claws, which means that, in a sense, she's connected both to the infinite and to the terrestrial to the to the earth bound life as well so she connects both of those realms and she was considered like the goddess of love and sex and she was basically the goddess who overcame death and here in this particular portrayal she's standing on lions which are obviously symbols of power and She's flanked by two owls, which represented wisdom in that culture, which is why we get the wise owl uh, definition sometimes, because these were the, the creatures, these were the, the animal powers that represented wisdom for the goddess. And so she was, in fact, one of the first deities that was worshipped in many temples in Sumer were built in her honor, Inanna Astarte, I think in the Assyrian cultures. Same, same references, a uh, different name for the same um, deity, same uh, qualities or qualitylessness. And here we had, of course, we met Abigail, one of his, one of her um, chief uh, priests, in, in the temple at Mari. And what, I, what we mentioned before was that the eyes are very significant in these pieces of art in the sense that they represent being totally awake, being awake in the presence of the divinity, in, in the presence of the absolute, if you will. And these works of art were created right in that space, in the space of awakening. And so this was, meant, this was meant to convey that through the presence of these uh, works of art. And it still does if you look very closely at them and just hang out even for a little while with these wonderful works. You'll see what I mean.
and then we went on to Egypt and uh, through the various stages of uh, that civilization just multifarious works of great art and architecture were produced but uh, one of the most significant was created in the New Kingdom during the reign of Akhenaten and Nefertiti. The art and the architecture was of a singularly uh, elevated style and during that period also the first introduction of what would be known later as monotheism, uh, the, the adoration and uh, giving up to uh, in, in uh, reverent prayer uh, everything to the Aten, the, the symbol which was a sun disk, but really which was represented by the Aten as, as uh, a beam of light. A light beam was their Bible, if you will. It was the symbol of their highest uh, symbolic gesture to the Absolute. So light itself was what was the symbol for the, the highest unknowable unknown. And uh, so some of the greatest art, I believe, was also produced during the Amarna period, which was this phase of Egyptian civilization. And we did discuss some of the, um, the great works that were created by Akhenaten, if only for a very, very, very brief period at Akhenaten. And then we went on to get to the what seemed to me to be the, the chief and most useful, even today, work of art that, and, and basically literature and information that was passed on through the art of Egypt, ancient Egypt, was the Book of the Dead, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, or actually the going forth by day, as it's really known as in, in their translation of things. The going from the material uh, consciousness that is limited and constricted into this, into the realm of endless light and potential and everything is possible in that realm. And so the Egyptian Book of the Dead, as it's called now, was a guidebook through all the uh, labyrinthine twistings and turnings of the consciousness as it went through the process after termination of the human form, after cessation of, of the body, it was thought, and, and very clear, not just thought, but known to be so that the human has the potential to go through the, the process of death consciously with what would be called the Ka, the Ba, the Ak, and all, all sorts of various other terminologies. Basically, a body that allowed you to go through the transition of death, the transit body, if you will, that lets you go through the duad or the underworld into the, into the various levels of existence below simple physical existence or beyond simple physical existence, and then through guidance from this particular book, either read to the deceased in person or uh, by readers and uh, priests after the death of the body. Uh, the guidance is established through sound, through mental projection, through, through a, a feeling projection in the practitioners, and then that grounding in the teaching, as it were, of the Book of the Dead, of what is enabling one to go beyond getting ensnared in something that would lead to a, a recycled existence, which was uh, demonstrated by Ahmet. Now here's Anubis, the undertaker, so to speak, the one who takes the uh, the deceased into the chambers that go before Osiris, the Lord of Death, and there's a heart that's being weighed by the feather of truth. And of course, we, we discussed the fact that this heart and this feather represented oneself, both, and the fact that if we are undivided within ourselves, 
then there cannot be any imbalance, and then the truth and one's heart are identical, and therefore one is able to go on past the Lord of Death into the realm of pure light, clear light, and there establishes, you know, is one is established in one's true nature. And subsequent uh, cultures and teachings go more deeply into some of these aspects. The point is that the Egyptians are the first ones that we know of. They started in the pyramids themselves, in the great pyramids of, of uh, the Old Kingdom, uh, giving uh, guidance texts to the deceased, the, nobil the nobility and the pharaohs and, their, and the royal families. And then later on in the Middle Kingdom, they were turned into what were called the coffin texts, where the, where the actual um, books or instructions were painted into the actual coffins, on the coffins and on, on the actual mummies themselves. And then after that, into, into the New Kingdom, and thereafter, they, they used papyrus scrolls. And this is the, uh, one of the famous uh, papyri, I think, of Ani going through as Osiris. And of course, the, the voyager through the after, the post-death, <laughs> the post-terminus states identifies with actually the Lord of Death, who is actually also the Lord of Resurrection, the resurrection into one's pure light nature, into one's pure truth nature, and uh, pure potential nature in every way, unlimited. And so these, these papyri came down to us and are, in fact, I think, one of the most important, if not the most important, uh, art that has been passed on to us from ancient Egypt. And we can use that even today, at this very moment, to understand our own existence and what we need to do in order to realize liberation and awakening. And the books of the dead weren't just used during the death after death, but they were used, for example, by the pharaohs as a daily life practice. And the, uh, the way that the Egyptian Book of the Dead was laid out was that the entirety of Egypt was, in fact, mapped out as an earthly version of these post-terminus states. And uh, the pharaoh would go from one pylon to the next, and he would pass through each of these different, um, let's say, challenges <laughs> at various temples along his route as, as the, the ruler of Egypt, but as also as a spiritual incarnation of Osiris and of Ra, the, the god that was considered by many at that time to be the supreme god the sun, but once again, we can use that not just as a physical, material uh, designation, but also as a symbol for that which was beyond anything that we could conceive of, you know, as, as bright and as great as the sun is, that is what we are aspiring to be, be merging with, to be at one with. And so, the, the Book of the Dead as it was called, and as it's been called recently, uh, is in fact a great gift to all mankind. And it has had uh, other more modern equivalents, such as the Tibetan and the American Books of the Dead. And they are very, very well worth looking into by us, by everyone who sees this. Take a look at them. They are very, very necessary sets of information for a human being who is about to die, or anyone who's been born and at some point will die. Check those books out, the Tibetan Book of the Dead and the American Book of the Dead. They are masterpieces and are vital pieces of information for us in our spiritual conscious evolution. So, so we left Egypt, <laughs> and uh, slowly, <laughs> we left Egypt slowly, and uh, so today we're going to get into the cultures that are more familiar to a lot of uh, 
people who live in the West, West in, the, in Europe and in, in the American continent, on the American continent now. Um, this is a symbol, a pattern for what was once thought to be the pattern of the labyrinth at Knossos in Crete. Now the culture that had this uh, symbol that, that created this was the uh, Minoan, which was uh, very much influenced by the ancient Egyptians. Their art and architecture has many similarities, although it's a lot st starker <laughs> in many ways, a lot less elaborate at least in, in the Cretan version of the architecture, but it, you can see many, very, very many borrowings from the ancient Egyptian culture. And yet it was also very unique. And in terms of Mediterranean cultures, it's probably the last one that was firmly established in the worship of the great goddess the great feminine. And on Crete, the island of Crete, which lasted a long time, over a thousand years at least, maybe 1,200 years, this culture, I think, um, it, it preceded uh, the Mycenaeans and the Etruscans. Uh, the, the Mycenaeans became the Greek, the ancient, the classical Greeks, and the, the Etruscans became the Romans eventually. Uh, but those cultures, were preceded by the Minoan. And this culture was, for all intents and purposes, mostly peaceful. Um, the emphasis on everything was quite different than, than in the, uh, on the continental <laughs> cultures of Greece and Rome after, after it. But let's uh, look at the, the, by the way, at one time, the, the labyrinth of Knossos, of, of Min I think it was Minos, yes, uh, who built it, was supposed to have been one of the true wonders of the world. Supposedly had something like 1,500 rooms in it, and, and they were, it was a labyrinth. And the thing about a labyrinth is it's not the same as a maze. There are no dead ends in a labyrinth. But what happens in labyrinths is that you just get exhausted <laughs> and you quit. And that's how you get lost in a labyrinth. Whereas in a maze there are, or there are dead ends and, and places that don't lead to the, to the final resolution of, of uh, reaching your goal. The labyrinth doesn't do that. But you can't quit. Once you enter the labyrinth, you have to go all the way through it. And that's one of the important factors about the labyrinth. Another important factor about the labyrinth as it was originally established in Crete is that all they can say is that a great lady, the great goddess, was the keeper of the labyrinth. And that the tributes given to her were as many as all the other gods combined. She received as many tributes as all the other gods, all the other deities. And therefore, in a sense, she, she was the, the supreme deity that looking after the labyrinth. And the labyrinth originally um, was not about a hero having to go into the middle of it and fight off a monster. Now that was a later addition. The original version of the labyrinth story, the, the labyrinth metaphor, is that it, it fa in fact was the pattern of a dance of lovers, of many lovers dancing in perfect uh, symmetry, you might say asymmetry and symmetry together and arriving at the center. It was, it was actually a love dance uh, pattern that the labyrinth was um, representing. And later on, probably when it got into the hands of the, the warriors of Mycenae, the, the, uh, the so-called great uh, warriors of uh, Greece, 
that we know about from the Iliad and the Odyssey and so forth, uh, the labyrinth was portrayed more as having to do with um, transgressions against the gods, the uh, central figure in the labyrinth, after, after one is able to, to navigate all its twists and turns, is what was called the Minotaur, which was a half man, half bull uh, entity, a being like that who was, in a sense, tortured. And supposedly Theseus was the, the one who slew the Minotaur at the center of the labyrinth uh, of Minos. Uh, and yet, you cannot slay the Minotaur because when you, when you collapse all, all dualities, all fragmentation into one, then the only way that one can address, you might say, the, the hero in oneself and the beast in oneself has to be addressed uh, impartially and with love, not with violence, not with aggression. And this is the most, most difficult thing because that minotaur, that chronic defense mechanism in ourselves, that will do anything whatsoever to stay in control and keep things as they are, even though the way things are is based on terror, fear, and just basically ignorance. But the only thing that will really transform the minotaur at the center of the labyrinth as, as, uh, as it exists, not just in ancient times, but in each of us, because it is a parable, and it is a metaphor for each of us to, to take into our consciousness and understand from. It is something that we need to understand, not just about some external event and some kind of outside thing. It's inside of us, inside e each of us who can understand and comprehend this, that what is inside of us that, that um, thwarts all our efforts to arrive, you might say, at the higher levels in ourselves, is this reflex, this defense mechanism. And the only thing that will truly render it useful in the sense of our own work and our, and our own existence is impartial, equanimitous love. It is that equanimitous love that will allow us to transform the Minotaur from a monster into a servant of higher evolution, of conscious evolution. And so these symbols, when they were done, it ha intended to uh, impart a message to us in the future, not just at the present, when they were built, at the time that they were built, but far into the future in the sense that we are still directly connected to those human beings who generated these symbols and these works of art and architecture. And so we will go on from the labyrinth now that we've sort of gotten a little glimpse of what it could be, that it was originally a dance, a dance of love, bringing the polarities, so-called, so no, the complementary energies, not polarities, but complementary energies of our own humanity, the masculine, feminine, in terms of our own species, into harmony at the unified center source, a unity that there, that, I'm sorry, a, a unity that thereafter could not be um, split apart, that could not be uh, disrupted once it was unified. And so this is the uh, aerial view of the palace at Knossos. And it's, it's not huge, but apparently the labyrinth was not necessarily this place. And if it was this place, apparently there are accounts of it. And it was supposed to have been huge with a, some, something like a, a pyramid inside the central chamber as well. So it was supposed to have been a, a, a true marvel so what they found here isn't necessarily the labyrinth, but it is considered to be the palace of Knossos on the island of Crete. And what archaeological remains there are, uh, are these. It's not huge, but then there weren't that many human beings at the time. 
And as you can see, the pillars are prototypical in a sense, but very much like some of the early Egyptian columns and so forth, but with the Mediterranean style of the Cretans. But once again, here is the, uh, the symbol of the feminine. And the breasts being exposed obviously shows that the feminine was not covered up. The feminine power was in fact in full array and full force. The feminine goddess, the great feminine here, holds two snakes, you know, the opposites and she's holding them in check and in balance. And she has power and wisdom and subtlety. And in this context, this representation of the feminine shows the real position that women held in that culture. They were very highly regarded and the men, in fact, were the ones who were taught by the, the, the women priests, priestesses, I'm sorry. The priestesses here were the teachers and the divine emissaries to the great goddess. And uh, as mentioned earlier in, my, in another occasion, uh, instead of making war, the, the guys, the men, actually jumped bulls instead, you know, for, for something exciting to do. And the bull jumping was obviously a very, very <laughs> uh, challenging uh, sort of activity, but it also showed that the pursuits of the males were much more in keeping with what the feminine uh, side of their nature was uh, directing them to do. And so the males got plenty of exercise, but you can see also that this kind of focus didn't have much in terms of aggression, you know, uh, warriors dressed in, in armor and with spears and all that kind of stuff. It doesn't seem to be present in this culture, which, hey, <laughs> what a great thing to celebrate. Um, obviously, they were also in tune with uh, the dolphins, because here they are. And dolphins may have ob obviously been recognized as, as kindred intelligences, and they were given uh, their due uh, reverence, as, as seen in this uh, fresco. Wonderful, beautiful, uh, beautifully painted and colored fresco. So the, the feminine aspect, the fluidity, and the, and the nurturingness, and the, you might say, the pacifistic tendencies were powerfully demonstrated, and this is, you know, look at, this is a woman, you know, this is a woman with something to offer, you know, this is a woman of power who has obviously great stature and great presence, and she's offering something in, in a way that speaks of confidence and of the ability to realize whatever it is that she's determined to, to do. Yeah, so these women in this culture, in the Minoan culture, were definitely, definitely uh, very much uh, given respect and were also in charge, basically, of the culture in many, many ways, especially the spiritual aspect of the culture and the teaching aspect of it. And these are the males. So, I mean, when you look at this in terms of what the men are doing, they don't look effeminate, they look very <laughs> virile, but they also do not look like they are uh, aggressive. The postures are not aggressive, they are in fact very neutral, and they are carrying gifts and objects that are meant to be gifts to the divinity. This looks like an agricultural kind of motif. And perhaps a prince 
But the whole point is that the males in this culture seem not to have been aggressive in the sense of making war on each other and necessarily going out and uh, hurting each other. So, a very rare culture indeed, the Minoan. But then, of course, when we go from the, uh, the island of Crete to the mainland, to the Mycenaean, we get a much different picture. And this is, of course, from the classical Greek. And this is a caryatid. And this is a woman, a noble woman, who has uh, been put into slave servitude. And so she has been... Um, you, you've seen many of these figures in our modern architecture, even uh, the caryatid kinds of columns that they use in some of the neoclassical uh, revival buildings, even today, use caryatids. But they, few people understand that these women were once nobles, but because of their pride, they were enslaved in their finery, but they were made to, to carry out the, the menial jobs of slaves. But here, there is slavery now. The Greeks had slaves, and they, they were also obviously subjugating women in a different, they didn't have, women did not have the same respect in this Mycenaean culture and in the later classical Greek culture as the, the Minoan by any means. Women did not have the same power or authority. But one of the great um, revelations, however, from the Greek culture came through geometry and mathematics, and especially from the great philosopher and mathematician and magician Pythagoras. Now, Pythagoras was a student of Thales, who was also a philosopher. Uh, he believed in reincarnation. He believed in many different things that I think are still somewhat relevant, but one of the things that Pythagoras passed on to our culture, to our present day culture, was the notion that mathematics and number especially was in fact a universal that was beyond just material existence and that mathematics um, was at a different level altogether, that, that there was a mathematical realm from which our material world formed. In effect, it was the blueprint upon which all, all existence was based. And so there was a way also of going the opposite direction. If, if we came down from that realm, that we could also uh, reascend to that level through mathematics, through uh, geometry, through art that had that in it, that was uh, implementing, that was implementing the, the principles of the geometry and mathematics that Pythagoras uh, passed on. And he discovered theorem 30, uh, 47, I believe, which is one of the most important theorems. I'm not going to get into it at this point. This is a drawing of the golden section. The golden section is a rectangle that can be, you know, using various turnings of the hypotenuse and, and using the, the, those measurements and turning them onto the, into the, the side of a, a rectangle, you can create what would be called an infinite spiral. And so the, uh, I think it's 1.618 or 0.618, one of the two, they're, right, they're either a fraction or 1.618, I believe, is the number of the golden section ratio, and with it, you can go on infinitely. It's, it's one of the transcendental ratios, just as the, the pi number, the relationship of the circumference of, of uh, a circle to its diameter is a transcendental number. And so these were, in effect, popularized by the Greeks, although they weren't known about, apparently, by the ancient Egyptians and the Babylonians and the Syrians. These, these particular mathematical uh, transcendental 
um, realities were known about before the Greeks, but the Greeks popularized them for us anyway. They carried them to us to the, to the present day, and that, that's who we got it from actually via the Arabs. But the point is that this ratio was used in all the architecture and all the art at a certain period in Greek history because it was thought to be divine. It was supposed it was the divine ratio, and that's why they called it the golden section because it was immutable. It didn't have an end to it. It didn't have a beginning to it in a sense. You couldn't find anything that would <laughs> that you could um, anchor it to. It would keep going on forever. And so they thought, therefore, that if they built their buildings, like this is the Acropolis, a plan, frontal uh, plan of the Acropolis, if they built the Acropolis according to the golden section, which they did, and many of this, everything in terms of the sculptor was also using this, this ratio, then it would in fact imbue this, this space with this immutability and that entering into it you would you would be inducted upward through the force of this transcendental force that was present in that math mathematical magic that they employed and so here's the original <laughs> which uh, has seen better days <laughs> but uh, once again it's still it's still beautiful in terms of its proportions and in terms of of the impact it still has on people even today and because it's been the inspiration for practically everything in uh, Western culture what we consider Western culture which is European uh, going basically east from Turkey to to the, the Americas um, this particular type of architecture and the, the geometries and the, and the proportions that were used in it has been carried on even to the present day and this is the apparently a full life-size replica of the Acropolis in Nashville, Tennessee. It's great. It's great that we're able to actually continue these uh, works of art through uh, the works that have been preserved for us because they do have value in terms of, of awakening us to the possibilities. Now, this is the... Uh, <laughs> The golden rectangle in its many permutations. This, as you can see, the smaller rectangles turn into bigger ones and bigger ones, and vice versa. The bigger ones turn into smaller ones and smaller ones. And so these these geometrical relationships apparently affect us. They affect us in ways that awaken us to deeper potentials in ourselves, because we are still looking at them. And I'll give you an example of something that's very familiar. This is the Venus de Milo. And now, many people <laughs> will have seen this beautiful uh, masterpiece uh, of, of uh, sculptural work. And they don't see how it's slightly <laughs> disproportionate in a way, because the sculptor actually used the golden section, which is a spiral that is being reduced in size. So if you go up to the hips, you can see that they're of one size. And if you go from the hips to, let's say, the, the bottom of the, this part of the torso here, from here to here, it's of a different proportion. And if you go from that to the top of the head, you'll see that that is also being Slight, it's, it's of another, another proportion. And what's happening is that the golden section is spiraling from a, a larger rectangle into a smaller one into a smaller one as it goes up the body. And it's an incredible work of art. It looks, <laughs> it looks perfect, and yet it, is, it has this asymmetry to it that tells us there's some kind of message implanted in it. And what the message is, is that we as human beings have an evolutionary nature to us. That even in our own bodies, there's an element of conscious evolution. And if we would just become cognizant of it, become fully aware of it, we can make use of it and evolve.
just as the Venus de Milo evolves. And once again, yet another version. This is of Zeus. Anyone who sees this sees the power, but, you, but they, they also see the equipoise, the poise in this work, that the highest god has, in fact, perfect poise, perfect balance, and in that context is omnipotent because of that. And Zeus was also considered all-wise, so omniscient and omnipotent and obviously in perfect balance. And so this is transmitting something to us about our own nature, that in order to realize the higher aspect of ourselves, uh, the higher potentials in ourselves, we do need to be in balance, perfect balance. And when we arrive at that perfect balance, there is no limit to how high we can rise or how wide we can extend our consciousness something worth considering. And this culture, of course, was uh, concurrent with some of the ancient Greek uh, civilizations, the Spartan and the Athenian. And this is the Persian. This is the Persian uh, culture, the ancient Persian cu culture of uh, Zoroaster. Uh, Zoroaster was a, a, a prophet, you might say, the, the manifestation of divine knowledge and, uh, and force, compassion, all virtue in a sense. And he transmitted the teaching about Ahura Mazda, which was the, the, the principle of absolute good. Uh, which was uh, also, uh, <laughs> you might say, opposed by something, uh, by an entity called Ariman, kind of like a very dualistic notion of reality. And what's not known about the Zor Zoroastrian uh, teachings and religion was that beyond uh, the Ariman and uh, Ahura Mazda manifestations, you know, like the dualist, you might say the complementary poles, but dualistic light and dark aspects of reality was Zorvan, uh, the all creator, the creator of both these. So there was a unified force that generated the, the two opposites, you might say. And yet what came down and was practiced turned into a very, you might say, dualistic kind of approach to reality. And from this approach that the Persians adopted of, of uh, absolute light and absolute dark, and, the, and in fact the light would eventually win out over the darkness, uh, that idea, that incomplete idea of what Zoroaster taught, became adopted and became the blueprint, unfortunately, for every culture that has had a so-called monotheistic religion, that there is some kind of absolute good and absolute evil, and that eventually evil will be overcome by light and goodness, you know, good and evil. And yet, that was not the complete teaching of Zoroaster. Zoroaster taught that this unified being creator, this unified creator, created these other two entities, and that their interaction was only a partial view of reality, that the real, that the real view of reality was beyond any kind of dualism, and yet the dualistic notion of reality that has been passed down, especially through the Persian culture, has, uh, has still imprinted most of what happens in this world today. 
the idea of absolute good and absolute evil and that some kind of uh, apocalyptic end has to happen where good triumphs over evil. Whereas it's not going to happen because they're basically equally <laughs> equally matched at some point. And, you know, whatever happens, it, it's it's a recurrent cycle. And to get out of the recurrent cycle, one has to go back beyond the original point of creating the duality. And this relates to ourselves. Each of us must go beyond any kind of, any sense of duality, any sense of judgment in the sense of splitting one thing from another. And one has to go back beyond into the unified state, beyond any duality to realize it. And so this is Zarathustra and uh, Ahura Mazda imparting divine knowledge, the knowledge of uh, eternity and infinity to the rulers of the, of the, per the ancient Persian Empire. And this is a uh, view of a very, very elaborate Persepolis, <laughs> the overview of Persepolis as seen from the air. It's very much squared off, very rigid in terms of its uh, delineations. Everything is square. Everything is, in fact, um, restricted in its symmetry. There is no <laughs> very little asymmetry allowed here. Nothing like the uh, uh, Incas nothing organic. It's very much imposition of will over materials. And it's, it's unmoving. It's very hard to move a square, a square block, a cube. And this is, uh, yeah, this is the view of the great city of Persepolis, as you can see laid out in a grid, and yet it speaks of domination and subservience. This type of architecture relates to a, a path that was taken when this absolute good and absolute evil notion of reality came about and was taken in as some kind of real view. Uh, as you can see, tribute has to be paid to the all ruler and therefore you know anything that isn't <laughs> going to do that will be receiving its just desserts apparently and uh, once again you can see in this architecture it is still post and lintel it's very very solid very uh, thick although the, the columns are beautiful in terms of how, how beautifully carved they are and how elegant they are. So there is definitely an aspiration for, for ascension, but at the same time, the, the um, if you can take a look here, the bull is being attacked by the, uh, the lion. It's basically, it seems to me, um, a statement that the feminine is, is really being considered uh, not an equal. That the male, the masculine, the aggressive energy, the, the forceful energy is predominant and that the, the passive energy is, is weaker and therefore deserves to be attacked and subdued. And, and this attitude has come through from this culture to a lot of cultures thereafter, you know, the, the age of empires in a sense, but it's always been the conflicted kind of uh, attitudes that have gone along with it that have perpetuated a lot of the suffering that's happened. And, and so this kind of architecture is a statement that power alone, power and force are not going to do it. You know, if there's just an overwhelming amount of power without any wisdom to it, it will collapse in on itself. It will destroy itself ultimately. And uh, 
as you can see these are incredibly powerful looking figures there's force in them but there's a certain mercilessness to them too and so this kind of attitude about the higher is is uh, something that developed and yet a lot of the architecture and art that has come to us is not of this kind it's it's something of a totally different order this talks about power and in a sense dispassionateness and yet when there's compassion and love there's very little compassion and love in the architecture and art of this particular culture and it's uh, notable But the inheritors, the inheritors of Persian as well as the Greek uh, cultures were the Romans who came later. Of course, Pythagoras was a great mathematician and an influence, and he influenced later philosophers such as Socrates, who was also a Pythagorean, and his student Plato. And Plato, of course, became the exponent of the, the previous Pythagorean schooling values and philosophies. And so through him, the great architecture of Greece was realized, I think, in, in the Odeons, these amphitheaters that they created, because there were five solids, the tetrahedron, the octahedron, the icosahedron, the cube, and the dodecahedron. And they were different figures, uh, triangular, four-sided, eight-sided. Tetra was the four-sided. Octahedron was the eight-sided. The icosahedron was the 20-sided figure. Um, the, the cube was obviously six squares. And the dodecahedron was 12 pentagons put together in, in a, um, polygons that were equal in all directions. <laughs> and so the perfect solids, as they were called, were the preliminary steps to perfection, but the, the, the geometrical form that was considered to be perfect by the Greeks was the sphere. And so anything that they could create that was circular and, in a sense, denoting sphericity was then considered a space of, of initiation. So I'm going to read you a little something about the possible original intentions of the Odeons, of the Greeks, and then after them, the Romans. And so I did discuss this with an, with an architect friend of mine, and our discussion really related to these Odeons and the point of focus, which was right at the very center of the Odeon. And the Odeon itself was constructed in tiers. But the point of focus is that point where you hear everything. If you ever stand under a dome or in one of these really perfectly created Odeons, you'll hear this. The sound comes back to you from every direction, just like uh, an astronomical mirror focusing light, it's the same principle. And so contrary to modern and conventional ancient ideas concerning the Odeons, these places were not at all designed for popular entertainment, which is the disuse they eventually fell into, but for the conscious transformation en masse of an entire school of prepared initiates. And into a more profound depth and breadth of being conscious. That's, that's what the purpose of these was. They weren't used for entertainment at all. Why would they? Why would they create these perfect pieces of architecture just, just for amusement? No, they, they had a higher purpose. And so, uh, so the means utilized in the Odeons at that point was via sound. Everyone's heard of Greek choirs. Nobody knows that they actually existed, though. They actually did exist. The master invocational key was 
and is known as the sound of silence. The sound of silence. The tiers of seats were like notes on a piano. Those closest to the center were of the highest pitch, and uh, those closest to the circumference were of the lowest. And one primary formation had the semicircle divided into half. Each half would represent either an active or passive series of sounds to be produced. Okay? The singing or chanting of the choir would follow a specified formula. Now the master would stand at the exact center in the point of focus where everyone, and I mean everyone, could be heard perfectly. This would be kind of the position of what the conductor of an orchestra would be like, only this was meant for conscious transformation of everyone involved in the music, in the singing. And uh, this was singing. So she, capital S, capital H, E. In other words, a unified human being who had unified both the masculine and feminine parts of themselves would be at the center. And they would guide and balance the active passive sounds. They would be the guidance system for everyone in that space of initiation. So at critical points, the master would master or mistress would interject a balancing sound into the already existing frequencies. In other words, symmetricity basically decays things. So you, ha you have to introduce an asymmetrical element in order for something to keep going. And so this would be the, the uh, function, one of the functions of the master at the center. And so this interjection would completely smooth and balance any disharmony, while at the same time introducing a new element to the tonality. And th this tonality would then be the new course along which the choir would direct its energies. So, you know, somewhat like a course correction is applied in space flight navigation. Each of these corrections would correspond to a jump in how each of the members individually and as a whole were conscious at that moment. Now, if you haven't done this kind of work, you'll never know what I'm talking about, but those who do and those who have attempted this will understand that one can become more conscious. One can become more awake doing this kind of work, and it becomes permanent. It becomes part of one's... Uh, bioelectrical information, but it's also something that goes beyond it. So, eventually certain plateaus of being conscious could be stabilized. This occurred when any fluctuations of a specific order of intensity and duration would completely cancel out, shifting the entire spectrum into a new range of tonalities, harmonics, and subharmonics. So, this kind of work was basically internalizing and externalizing, like a, an ebb and flow, giving and receiving that was amplified. It was like an accelerometer of conscious force that was being worked with. <laughs> and the idea was that because tone and tonality and sound was considered to be a divine pathway, a pathway to divinity in a sense, in terms of purifying and opening up consciousness and being. This is the reason. So the, the shift in the outwardly perceivable sound eventually was accompanied by a parallel in being conscious. That's it. Gradually, all gross sounds would fade away. And the point is that the active passive sounds would try and cancel one another out. This, this, is, this is high level work. And it's intended to awaken consciousness. It's intended to permanentize uh, anything, make, make something permanent in terms of a shift in being conscious, in just, just in being. Gradually, all gross sounds would fade away, and only the simultaneous breathing in and out, out and in, of an entire unified composite cell. In other words, the little, the players that came in, the singers that came in, the initiates that came into this space are now unified, consciously, consciously unified. Wow. 
And you know, this this sound, the sound that would be of a unified composite cell, would eventually recede to a zero point, and then only a heartbeat, a common heartbeat, could be felt and sensed for all of them, which was you know just in the flow of blood, whatever else, and you know then various uh, changes would have ultra high ringings or crackling noise, you know, but these are internal, high pitched, low pitched. And then uh, these sorts of spasmings between sound and silence altogether ceased and there would reign an inutterable peace. An inutterable peace would happen to everyone. And this kind of work, which was not accidental, was not entertainment, was what was really the function and purpose of these odions, originally. Don't forget, the philosophers and the deepest thinkers and mystics of the time were the ones who, who originated this mathematics, this geometry. It all had a higher meaning. It all had a higher function. And the higher function was always that human beings could evolve could evolve consciously to the next level of being, to the, next, to the next level of body, in a sense. The sound was altering the molecular structure of the bodies themselves. So uh, this indivisibility you know, of, of an atom that was created eventually from many parts into one, like droplets of water forming a, a bigger hole. S holes forming, going into greater wholeness was what the, the aim of this kind of work was. And uh, eventually, the scale of being would manifest whatever possibilities were inherent to being conscious as such. And so, this is an example that we look at these things, we have them even in our, our everyday existence now. We still have odions, but we don't know what the original intention and purpose of these was. And this was certainly one of the purposes. So, thanks for listening to that, but it really is a wonderful inspiration to know. And here, of course, this is the real odeon. And there's someone <laughs> standing at the point of focus, as you can see. And so the sound is, you know, from perpendicular and from straight horizontal, is coming from every direction and is focusing at that point. And it's, it's a point of power. And it's a point of control. And so, so we go from something that's horizontal, like an Odeon, and then we're going now to what followed the, the Greeks was the Romans, and the Romans, above all, created two forms that, that have in, had enduring uh, impact on, on the architecture and art of every culture thereafter, and it's the dome, and it's the curved circular Roman arch. And these two structures were exemplified in this wonderful uh, dome structure known as the Pantheon. The Pantheon housed, uh, originally housed all the, the Roman deities, which were carryovers from the Greek deities, that Pantheon. And as you can see, there are cells in the, in the uh, dome of the Pantheon with an oculus, an opening, just a wide, o you know, just an open hole at the top of it. And those cells that were constructed uh, from concrete uh, are still standing today. So the Romans had the formula for concrete, for cement. And you can see kind of like a nouveau Corinthian columns, <laughs> canthus leaves, or is that oak leaves? I think this was built by the Emperor Hadrian, or at least commissioned to be built by the Emperor Hadrian. And there's the oculus of the Pantheon, one of the most famous and influential buildings ever built. 
it is said that when during the Dark Ages, <laughs> the beginning of the Dark Ages, when the Vandals basically sacked Rome and pretty well destroyed everything, their leader rushed into the Pantheon with his troops and they were stopped dead in their tracks when they saw the, the magnificence and just the splendor, not just the splendor, but the overwhelming force of something greater than their level of understanding. And they left it be. They let it be. They didn't touch it. It was the only place in Rome that they didn't sack or pillage because they thought that this truly was some kind of otherworldly manifestation here. And they left it. And thank goodness for that. It was the Christian church that basically removed all the gods and replaced them with uh, Christian saints. You know, one, one form replaces another. Yet the underlying basis of it is the same. And you can see here, this is the Roman arch. And during the, like I said, during the Dark Ages, though, the formula for cement, for concrete, was lost. So all these structures that the Romans built used concrete. Those cells were made out of concrete. And they, they still stand after 2,000 years, which is good concrete. The, th the thing is that the stability of a curved arch, a round arch like this, has been proven to be one of the most stable forms in nature and in human architecture. And so there it is. The tall things, the pillars will fall down, but the arches will stand because they have dynamic tension holding them, you know, the weight from above and the pushing up from underneath and the compression and the way the cells are pushing against one another creates a dynamic tension that is one of the strongest in nature. And so there it is. The Roman arches still stand and are still used, some of them, like this aqueduct is still used. It still carries water. Amazing, after 2,000 years, they're still using these things. So that's, the Romans were the, the greatest architects and engineers in that way. They were engineers more than, you know, artists in some ways, but their, their engineering skills and their organizational skills have carried on to our present day world. And uh, so that's our presentation for tonight. And uh, we've gone through a few sectors. This is quite important though, because the Roman and the Greek are, and the Persian in, in, in kind of a, uh, an indirect way, are still affecting the attitudes and the very ideas which we use in, through our own minds in, in this culture that we are living in now. And, but yet there are many, many other cultures with a great vast wealth of um, beneficial ideas yet to come. And so to wrap it up for this evening, I'd like to ask Deborah Judith to do an invocational piece on piano and uh, let you enjoy the voyage out of this particular journey. So thank you. Here's Deborah Judith.
awesome. Lubomir and I are doing a two piano concert in June, perhaps the 12th. Anyhow. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this installment of the Architects of Conscious Transformation. And we'll see you next time.